Hey guys, my name is Daryl. I'm an alcoholic. I have to start out first and say that the main thing I don't want to do today is lie and cuss. So um, anyway, I was born in a small town in Georgia. Damn it, that's a lie. Okay, right, right. So for me, the hardest part of my life I had so much trauma growing up. The hardest part of my life today is finding what was a lie. What was the truth, right? Because I think we cover up so much of our lives and we make a better life than what we had. And when we go through these steps, shit gets real, right? And then you're like, now I know why I buried all that shit. But the awesomeness of the steps is the fact that it gives you a process, right? The things I feared you know, making amends, you know, all this kind of crap. Anything to keep me from being sober, I would focus on, right? So I'm going to bring, I just want to make a clarification with something that's really important for me to say. It doesn't matter if I drank every day, if I used every day, it doesn't, if I ran in front of cars every day, or if someone told me that shaking a hand with a monkey would make me feel different, I would do it right? And I want to tell you, this is my home group. This is where I got sober. You know I me? Mean? I don't remember all the other meetings I went to. I don't remember other things that were said. This is my home group. And I remember sitting back on a row when I couldn't stand for people to sit beside me. I mean, it was like push, push, you know what I mean? Because I needed my space. I needed room to grow, Right? So, did I start that sucker? Yep. Oh my God, I have 28 minutes to go. Good luck with that. <laughs> so, there definitely will be lies. Okay. So, um, I mean, hey, you know, my sponsor said it's not about you, which really put it off. I was like, uh, you know. But in that, I want to say that um, listening in these rooms and being uncomfortable and not being able to move, and not wanting to be hugged, and not wanting to sit there and not be on my phone, and not want to be distracted. I ran across a person named Winnie, who's here today, and I, almost, I was really comfortable until your ass showed up. And then, <laughs> yeah, so thanks for screwing it all up. But um, I remember her speaking one day, and there was something profound that happened in my life. And she was talking, and I still am challenged with this every day of my life. She said that she was at a women's retreat. I remember it at someone's house. I was high, but I did get clarification this morning. So, um, uh, sorry, I'm in a meeting. Okay, good. Uh, so she said, you know, she was at this beautiful place looking over a lake with all this gorgeous, trees and you know I mean she's looking into this beautiful place and she sees a speck on the window and then boom it was gone right that speck took away all the serenity all of her peace you know it started diddly diddly diddly. and um I live in diddly diddly d um I I definitely Ooh, I hate people who say um so could you stop me thank you um ah <laughs> Jesus, I am powerless over um. Anyway, <laughs> um, no. So one thing that I really found in my life is while I may not be trying to feel different, we're going to use that word instead of all the other words, right? The point is I've tried to feel different, okay? And uh, today, I may be good in some parts, but where I really struggle is emotionally, being emotionally sober. You know, things get me twisted real quick. And my sponsor always says, why didn't you call me first? I'm like, I don't know when I'm going to be a psychotic bitch. I mean, it just comes out, you know? So, sorry, not that sober. But, um, but you know, one thing I have learned is that I can go back and make amends for that, right? and to do it quickly and to do it right. Because whether we wanna believe it or not, we are examples, 
right? What we do, the preachers who do the things some preachers do that really screw with people, that's not good. And we are examples of a new life, right? We're examples of our lives changing, of things turning around, that our lives get better, right? So I think that we forget often that it isn't just us that's being involved. There are people that are looking, right, for examples. So for me, that example that Winnie, that's what I remember, right? I was also struggling going through things with my sponsor, Darren, who, God forbid, I mean, he took me on, and he still does, so that's the miracle of the program. So <laughs> he has not led me astray as of yet, but I think that's because of Dave. Dave is it, you know. <laughs> you know, Dave is my prayer warrior behind it all, I'm sure. But um, I know that Dave and Darren saw me in the beginning come in, and I wanted this thing. I tried for two years to get sober. Everything in my life was terrible, right? But wanting to be something and being willing to accept the fact that you're powerless is two entirely different things. And knowing that you're powerless takes a while, right? Because we are covered up in shame and guilt. I felt buried alive in this, you know? And the reason I didn't really want to get sober is because I knew if I clawed my way out of this shit, I'm going to be right back on the surface to face the things that made me want to go down, right? A lot of people spend time on their uh, childhoods. And let me just say, I had a very traumatic childhood. That's my childhood. <laughs> so, and that I wasn't born in Georgia. I was born in Texas. Thank you. So um, I just think it's important for us to talk about what it was like for me. Um, powerlessness. Let's talk about that. I came up with a little, uh, I'm moving into a new condo. And I remember people recently saying, I never thought I would own a place. And I was like, you know what, bitch, whatever. You know what I mean? I really, I was like, whatever. Now I'm that bitch. And it's a miracle. <laughs> and I'm okay with that, too. <laughs> Don't you hate when you brush your teeth in the morning, it gets all bleh. Or when you get pulled over by a policeman, same shit. <laughs> Dry mouth. But, um, but I will tell you that um, <clears throat> in walking, powerlessness for me was continuing to do the same thing over and over and not really having the ability to stop, right? Two years of wanting it. I remember one time I had 59 days. And first of all, Kudos to all the people who have one hour or one day. I mean, I remember. That shit's real. I mean, I almost have a few years, and uh, that's not important. My every day is what's important, right? I do know for a fact that I am only one thought away from going down the hill. I was in an experience recently, probably eight months ago, and it didn't go over quickly. It was several, several, I would say, weeks <laughs> that I wanted to feel different. Nothing had happened in my life to make me want to feel that way. But that's risky territory when you don't know what it is and you want to get out there and do something different. It's like I didn't want to do the elements to make myself feel different. But I wanted to do something. But my sponsor always tells me, when it comes through fear, or someone's sponsor, I don't really listen to mine all the time, but, um, but someone did say, walk through it, right? Walk through it, ultimately you'll get to the other side. And I did, I didn't let it defeat me. Um, I have everything to lose by going back, right? We often know, someone said recently, you know, uh, there's a, <clears throat> there is a refund policy you're welcome to go back to your life of hell at any time. That's your choice, right? We're not holding you hostage. We're not demanding that you do these things. You're welcome to go back to hell if you want it. You know, uh, I don't want that. I, uh, in preparation for my move, am looking at all the damage I did in my apartment. 
I filled up my outlets with hot glue, covered them with black duct tape. I took out the vents. The one in my bedroom probably has several doggy toys because I swear someone lived in that one. Um, and then, yeah, I took off door frames. I, you know, took out, I think I have to replace six light fixtures. The one over the sink has been gone for years. So um, what, and it is kind of funny to look at that, but look at how alone I was, how desperate I was to feel different, right? It was awful. And I couldn't see that. I couldn't see anything. I took off a door frame. Who the, I mean, come on. I had a little wood sculpture. That poor bitch died quick. Um, you know, and, uh, but I didn't think about that at the time, how lonely, how depressed I was. Was it fun in the beginning to feel a little different? Sure. Didn't last long. Because ultimately, all the things we do to feel different don't work anymore. Right? And uh, I really, I struggle sometimes today and I see things, and I was really going to share this at the end, and I have something else. I'm going to read you a little letter. So I've been graced with a job today that enables me to go out and reach people that suffer from addiction. Right now, we're, we're faced with a fentanyl thing that is just wiping out people. And this, a third of what I do is Narcan. There's a guy in my group, I mean, that used to be in a part of another fellowship who lives in my building. And, you know, he'll come to me for food every once in a while. But I see the scabs on his face. I see the sweat. I see all these things that I used to have, right? Now, I, that's a lot. I never picked, but I poked a lot. <laughs> Shh, don't tell anyone. So... Anyway, he came to me the other day. I'd given him some Narcan, and this is a note he gave me. Hey, bud, things are going well with the big... I hope things are going well with your big move. I've been trying to get a hold of you because Cody and I really need Narcan, or two. There is a guy from Chicago who is selling China White, and Cody and this other guy almost overdosed the other day. We did have someone overdose who was a friend in our place. We used the Narcan. And I just want to make sure that Cody uh, has one just in case. I'm trying to order pizza from 7-Eleven so that Cody can have something to eat in him because he hasn't been able to eat all day. If you could help, that would be amazing. But I've already told him I couldn't help him at times, right? But if you can't, I totally understand. We just don't have a phone to call his mom ever since someone shot through our door. They won't allow me to use the phone at the front desk anymore. But whatever you can do would be amazing. Even if you can't do anything at all, I understand and it's okay. Thank you for everything you've done for us. You've saved a life today. That was my life right? That's where I was. That's an awful place to be, right? That's where I was. This is reality. All that, you know, I remember <laughs> when, I forget her name. She was really cute and blonde-headed, but um, she talked about her father uh, working with a cruise line, and when she was in Florida, how she wrapped her car around a tree, you know, and things like that. And I used to think, man, these alcoholics, they're off the chain. Shooting, yeah, for real. Like, there was someone who, I don't know, shot at a jail and put, I mean, like, it was crazy town. Um, but the reality is, I stayed at home, but I stayed in prison there, right? And uh, so it's been interesting for me. So I want to talk a little bit about powerlessness. If I go back and forth, Eh, that's on you. Get what you get. Um, but we admitted we were powerless over, for me, alcohol, our feeling different, and that our lives had become unmanageable. So I was pulled over by a policeman one time, actually for, they thought I was involved with someone next door to my dealer for some other reason. And they pulled me over and I had my little dog with me. And uh, we were talking I told him I didn't know anything about the thing next door. But when I was, my dealer didn't have 
20 bucks to pay me back the difference of a couch I sold her. So she gave me these crumbs, right? And when the police are behind me, I shove it under ice water. I don't know. I didn't know you could throw it beside. It's a good thing. I didn't know you could throw it beside your seat. You know, all the various things that they couldn't get into my car, right? Those are God working already. So they detained me for a very long time. And when a policeman says, we'll let you go, but you have handcuffs on, that's not going to happen. I promise you. So um, it didn't work for me. They took me down. I, they said they were going to put my dog in the pound. And I freaked out, right? Because not only am I screwing up my life, I'm messing up the life that's there. My dog and I are everything. So while it was just me picking up the dope, all of a sudden, I've affected him. And I think often we look at our own life and we don't look at those closest to us. You know, how are we, how are we affecting those people? How are they being challenged? If he had to be put into a, a kennel, could you believe that, Julia, if that happened with my little baby? No. So, and the thing is, Julia wasn't around. She's my, she's my mama to my baby and a very dear friend. And uh, there was an old lady in my building who the police were nice enough to take me by, let Titan stay with her. And this woman, like three hours, she'd be texting me, calling me, when are you going to get your dog? When are you going to get your dog? You know what I mean? I had to pray when he went there that he didn't get like a bad spirit. But uh, <laughs> I'm serious. She's gone now, so it's good. I mean, I, don't, I didn't mean... I mean, I have a new person, not her, but... She is gone, by the way. But what I want to say by that is the police told her I was going to jail, right? They told her, like, he's going to jail. Da, da, da. Three days later, I'm not getting a text or a call to come get my dog. And she knew exactly where I was. So when I go to jail, the policemen are like, dude, do you have any phone numbers? Like, I was like, where are you supposed to be tomorrow? Who can we tell that they're going to come and get you? You know, da, da, da. Never been to jail, never been arrested. So they kindly write down all these different phone numbers. And uh, they give them to me. Of course, they take your belongings. They take your cell phone, do all this. And so when I wait for my, the police said, oh, you'll get out, you'll get out. It'd be like a $500 bond. You know, you'd never done anything before. So I go in. I'm sitting there with all these people. My bail is set at $500, right? When I go out, the lady at the fingerprint says, oh, we didn't get your fingerprints right. You need to come back over here. So all of a sudden, I was in this room by myself, sitting there for about 40 minutes until the room filled back up. And then they called my name, and they opened the door, and it says intake. I'm like, oh, shit. Where's my call? They're like, oh, you should have been doing that right now. Now you're in the system. You have to go in. And I was like, man, these newcomers really need to know how to work this system. But guess what? That's God doing for me what I could not do for myself. Had I known any other way to get out of that, I would have. So then we go in. <laughs> Let me tell you, what they handed me in this nasty bag for me to put on, holy socks, there was actually blood residue in the bottom of this bag. You know what I mean? They take me in, and they're going down like the line, and this lady gives me a shot, and I lose it. I'm like, you can't just give me a shot? And I was like, I want to speak to the person in charge. Da, 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 da. I'm like freaking out, and then there's Lake going like this between me, mopping. She goes, he ain't going to do too good in here. And I did not. No. I did not. She, she was right on track, let me tell you. And then the next step was solitary confinement, which is great. A little room all to yourself, a little glass door, a little phone. Finally, but I didn't know my, I didn't know that when I got all these numbers, I was supposed to keep them. So they're in my clothes. So I have no numbers. I don't remember anything. I don't even know where I live, right? 
So I kept asking for these things. They finally got a hold of my attorney's phone number. And I call, and his secretary, who's been with him 42, now it'd be 48 years, um, he does like younger women, so I'm just wondering how young was she when it started. But that's not my problem, it's his. But uh, she forgot to tell him that I was in jail. So I see all these people leaving, right? Day one. All I did was cry and sleep. The sleep is because I was in desperate need of sleep, right? The crying is because I had no hope. No one, and I'm telling you, nobody's going to help you in jail. No one. Then these people were on the phones, like all these people, like da da da. So I started saying, could you find out the number for Manor House? Okay, there was just one guy sitting at the, at the thing, and he wouldn't help me. I'm like, dude, just Google the Manor House. He's like, we don't do that. We don't do that. So day two, then day three, and these people come and get me, and they said, okay, we've set your bond or your bail at $20. And I said, I don't know who to call. And they're like, there's nothing we can do for you. And they put me in the North Tower. And when I went there, I thought, this is it. This is it. I'm in jail for the rest of my life. Where's the bitch who has my dog going to call, right? So the reality is for that, when I was being moved over to the fourth, I mean, to the, I just said it right, wherever it was, North Tower, um, I thought that's it. And I remember going into a cell with eight other people and just kind of like freaking out. And the other guys are like, dude, I'm up against 25 to 50 years, right? I'm up against this. And I realized that I'm not the only one in this room who feels they've been not justified in being put in there. And then I went to sleep and I woke up and that little door was closed. And I freaked out. I freaked out real bad. Because I thought, this is it. I'm going to sleep with these seven guys. This is my life now. I want to wrap all that up by saying the first call I made when I left was to my dealer. Yeah. Right? All that shit, all that fear, all that hopelessness, all that pain, everything that I had instantly went like that. You know what my second thought is? I know what to do the hell when I get back. You know, I don't want to go back because everything there happened for a purpose and a reason. And that is truly what... Um, Best three days that changed my life. It doesn't stop there. So we kept going to court, and my judge wasn't there, wasn't there, wasn't there. It seemed to be every other Friday I would go. Never was there. So the day I wanted to feel different, <laughs> she showed up. And it was not good. The guy in front of me, who was up against the same charge I was, uh, came in, handcuffed, you know, the waist thing, the feet, and he goes in front of the judge, and uh, she tells him his charges, same as mine, here are the penalties, here are the da da right? And so at the end of it, he goes, I'm from Arizona, and they don't treat people that way. And she's like, well, you're in Texas now. And he goes, well, no lube to the judge. Like, you're just screwing me without Lou. Anyway, that did not go well. Um, she said, and he kept saying, like, you took my hearing aids. I can't hear. You can't, you know what I'm saying? So she's like, approach the bench. She goes, have you ever heard of the phrase, don't mess with Texas? I'm about to explain it to you. And so she told him that she, he had already served three months or something. They had agreed on six months, right? And then... She said, I'm going to go ahead and keep the original agreement. But in three months, when you come back, if you can't treat me, number one, like a lady, two, respect me like a judge, I will give you the fullest penalty. All right? She said, but I'm giving you grace. And so I thought, well, she can give him grace. She can give me grace. So the reality was that wasn't my story. I went up there, and they'd already made a decision. Now, understand, previous to this, I... Uh, Knew I had to go into probation 
to, um, cause that was something they already figured out before I saw the judge and, uh, or after, don't know, very feeling different at that point. Um, but when I went, I wanted to feel different about four in the morning when I was supposed to be there at 7.30 a.m. So I called and said I was sick. And then I'm not a good liar. So I ended up telling them what happened. And the lady says, I'll be right back. She goes back and she goes, the judge said, come in. I was like, bitch, you showed the judge. I'm dead. And uh, I went in. It was very pro a quick process because you know, they're like, have you been high in the dead of the day? So she just check, 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 check. Because she knew I was all there, right? Then the time that I went to ACT, which is where they send people with mental health issues, I was high then, right? Wanted to feel different. So all I'm saying is fear controls me. Fear and the unknown is where I'm most at risk to lose everything and fears every day right so we've got to face that so i say all that about powerlessness and that's truth so next one came to believe that a higher power could restore us to sanity if this is what you consider to be saying good luck with that um <laughs> but i will say i no longer do the things i did before I am able to have a conversation. I was able to go to school and get a 3.8 uh, to get my LCDC, which, you know, the first two times I went to treatment, I had counselors who had not had lived experience, and I'm like, I ain't learned nothing in school. So I don't know how you're gonna help me, and that's what really led me to the career I have today. I first became a mental health peer specialist because I dual diagnosis, right? So when you're sitting there with someone and they're just coming out of jail or, you know, all these other things, I can relate. I get it. I understand addiction. So what can I do in your life today to bridge that to a different way? Can I get you into sober housing? Can I get you connected with food stamps? Can I get you out of the house you're in right now? Can I talk to your CPS officer? What can I do to where you don't end up where you were before, right? That's a really good feeling to know you're doing that. God blesses me in so many other ways. My life right now is huge. Um, and when I say huge, I want to talk a little bit about this. Oh, yay, I have five, three more minutes. Hallelujah. Okay, we're going to wrap it up with this. <laughs> and if you didn't learn anything, that's your fault. So, <laughs> okay. This is the list Darren had me do in the beginning of my sobriety. Get a degree, three point. These are things, check marks is things that have happened, right? This was a wish list for a different life. I always thought it would be untangible. Get a degree, 3.5 to 4.0. Find a path that will lead me in my career. Have a cabin on the lake. Didn't get that, but I do have a condo on Haskell, right? <laughs> I mean, right? A core group of friends to travel with, to be comfortable with, and do things with. Blowing glass, I think I was thinking about a pipe. I'm not sure. But <laughs> notice it did not get checked. So um, a Volvo B70 or simply one that works. Darren saw me come to my first meeting with him with a bungee cord holding it up. Work on my body facelift. I looked into that, that's $20,000, so I'm just gonna let that roll. Right, let me turn this off, because it was on, we wish you a Merry Christmas, so, okay, good. So, next, loft apartment in a high rise, just as well. Do more outreach and service work. Got suckered into cake lady again a while ago. Um, <laughs> Make my sobriety the priority in my life, healthy relationships, have a better body image, and try to be less self-conscious. Be more open to things that I'm afraid of, to walk through them, even if it's not in my comfort zone. Quit soft drinks, on and off with that. Um, save money. Wow, I'm in a place right now where 
I just lost an enormous amount on the stock market, but that is flush money, right? I didn't have anything. I didn't know where I was going to feed my dog. Say yes to the idea of dating and or be in a relationship that could be a closer friendship. Still working on that. And meditation from, uh, uh, oh, consider meditation to be uh, addition, not subtraction, right? So that's all I have to share today, guys. But I want you to know, if you're looking at an example of someone who couldn't take it, I mean, I was done, done, and I'm not done today. That's right. That's guys. Yeah.